Well, good evening, and welcome back to Redeemed by Grace Fellowship. Uh, we've missed you this week, and we're glad you're back for our walk through the uh, Book of Acts together. Uh, we'll be looking at the first part of Chapter 9 tonight. We won't get all the way through it. It's a longer chapter, so we'll finish, finish it up next week. But kind of look back where we were in chapter 8. Uh, the first part of that, uh, coming off of chapter 7, Stephen was being uh, killed and martyred there. And we met the man named Saul. And Saul was uh, the man that they, they laid uh, their coats at his feet while they stoned Stephen to death. That uh, He was kind of one of the leaders there. And when we got into... Uh, uh, chapter 8 we saw that Saul was still angry he was ravaging the church and he was going house to house and pulling out the Christians out on the street and taking them off to prison to be uh, tortured to be dealt with to, even to be murdered and so it was a negative scene and, and it kind of caused all the disciples except the apostles to scatter and they scattered all about Judea, the central Israel, all the way up into Samaria uh, as well, uh, that they scattered across, trying to get away from this persecution that was coming down by the hand of Saul and uh, uh, as he was ravaging. And then the scene switched over to this magician. His name was Simon, you may recall. And uh, basically he... Uh, uh, man, he saw all the stuff that the apostles were doing through the Holy Spirit. And, you know, that's better than the magic I used to perform. People used to look at me and go, wow, check him out. He's good. And yet uh, they were doing stuff he didn't know how to do. So he tried to purchase this Holy Spirit stuff, if you remember, and got called out on the carpet with it and uh, was dealt with it. And he realized what uh, he had done wrong and asked the apostle, in particular Peter, to pray uh, for him and that he would be forgiven and that uh, the actual Holy Spirit would come about on that. And then we uh, switch scenes again. Uh, Philip, the, uh, one of the uh, deacons that was also ordained along with Stephen, uh, uh, God said, hey, I know you're running and you're down here, but I want you to head back down the road. And I want you to head south. And I want you to look for this chariot, this caravan that's there. And you're going to find an uh, Ethiopian eunuch. And he is right now reading the word of God and praying for somebody to help him understand what it is that he's reading. And so uh, God moves uh, Philip and gets him there. And sure enough, he gets up in there and was able to tell him and explain to him the word of God and to show that this has now been fulfilled because it was a prophecy about the Messiah and he showed how that has been fulfilled in Jesus Christ and and the eunuch believed and uh, was baptized on the road uh, and became saved now we uh, Philip was then immediately taken away to go back to a service at God had planned for him, preaching the gospel along the way on the path. And the meanwhile, the Ethiopian was doing the same heading home. And we do know that one of the largest Christian churches found on the continent of Africa was founded in Ethiopia. Uh, we don't have in the scripture a direct connection to this uh, uh, unit, but it was very well possible that that indeed is where some of the gospel began was from this gentleman coming back and telling the others about Christ. And so we get back to chapter 9, and when we get to chapter 9, we're switching back to Paul, Saul, and we're going to see what's going to happen to him today. So before we get started, let's go ahead and pray. And uh, and then we'll get in right into it. It's a great lesson today. So uh, let's pray. Almighty God, we're just so thankful we could come together to open up your word together, to study it. And we pray, Lord, that you would clear our mind of the clutter of life, that we might hear your voice. 
Help us to understand what it is that you would have us to understand through the indwelling Holy Spirit, that we might see your face and know your glory and understand your will. Draw us near, O oh Lord, to you. We pray that you would open our minds to salvation. If indeed we are ones that have not believed, that you would open our hearts to see the truth and to respond to it this very day. And we just thank you for that. And we lift this prayer in the precious and holy name of Jesus Christ, the one that we love. Amen and amen. So let's bring our screen back up here. There we go. I hope you can see that. I tried to use a little different font size for you this week. Someone had emailed me and told me it was kind of hard to see. So I tried to enlarge it a little bit without adding a gazillion more screens to, to get them through. I, I mean, it would take forever if we have one verse uh, per screen, but uh, uh, we'd be able to read it for sure, but uh, it would take a little longer. So go ahead and read along with me. If you have your copy of God's Word, you can read it there. You can read it off the screen, or if you're using a Bible app, you can do that as well. And again, there's several Bible apps that we've been talking about, uh, Bible Gateway. We've talked about Blue Letter. We've talked about uh, the Gideon's International Bible app. You can find all of those um, and uh, or one of them that you like best and uh, use that if you don't have a written copy. But uh, here's the word of God for us this evening. But Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asking for letters to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any belonging to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. We'll stop there and then we'll continue on here in a minute. And, and uh, that's a, a kind of an important thing that we've heard so far. A couple of things. Uh, who is this high priest? Is Capias? Capiaphas, if I could say his name right tonight. Sorry about that. Uh, and uh, that is who that is. Uh, you know, we have several high priests, but they are usually run in concession uh, of just to when they're in power so that there be one uh, ruling uh, per year in that capacity. Uh, so he went to the top dog and asked him, for um, basically these letters that they're talking about would, would be an equivalent in our military term as saying marching orders. Give me the documents I need that approves that you guys are sending me and I have the authority to come on your command and arrest these Christians and haul them back and do whatever it is because uh, we're going to treat them like criminals. Okay, just like they did Jesus uh, and, and that. And so, but we find a, a very interesting term there, don't we, uh, in verse 2. And that is where he uses that he, uh, uh, he might find any belonging to the way. Now, if you notice, the way is capitalized. Uh, this, my friends, is the very first term of whatever the Christian was called, uh, the way. You are a follower of the way. Um, and it's interesting when we look at the book of John that Christ says, I am the way, <laughs> and doesn't he? So that's very interesting in that per, uh, respect. But in this category, uh, that is what the people that belong to the Christian faith were called as members of the way. And so uh, that's the first time that that uh, phrase appears in Scripture. And that's very interesting that we see it here. But again, when we talk about what Acts is going to be going over as we go through this uh, great book, is is going to be talking a lot about the birth of the church. And so we're seeing those things uh, from uh, the floor up as we go down. So going to find uh, both men and women and that he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Uh, bound just like you would a criminal. Today we would use handcuffs, if you will, but they're going to bring them bound uh, 
to Jerusalem. And when uh, they did it in the Greco-Roman world and you dragged you to a town, sometimes that's exactly what it meant, that you were tied up and you got drug um, behind an animal to town because you didn't have much rights and they didn't really care whether you got hurt or not because you're a criminal. And that's kind of the way it was in there. Uh, now, verse 3, uh, I believe we still have that on this one. Uh, now, as he went on his way, he approached he approached Damascus. It's a, south, a town north of Jerusalem. I should have got a map here for you. It's uh, 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 north. It's still there today, as a matter of fact. Um, and so uh, they go up there, and suddenly a light from heaven shone around them. So you can imagine this. Here they are. They're walking up there. They're, they're, they're ravaging. They're going after these people. Man, you could see they're fired up to get there, and they're going to drag these people off. And they believe they're doing it all for the per God's purpose, don't they? Uh, because uh, they believe this is a heresy that needs to be put down. And uh, so uh, immediately or suddenly it says that it, a, a light from heaven shone around them <clears throat> and immediately falling to the ground this is Saul he heard a voice saying to him Saul Saul why are you persecuting me and he said who are you Lord and it's interesting he just used that term Lord because he's recognizing an authority that is greater than he at that moment by using that term and so he says who are you lord and he being the the one that the voice is says i am jesus whom you are persecuting so the same guy that he is trying to murder anybody that believes in is just came right before him and said what's up why are you doing this? God is intervening in Saul's life. He's going to change Saul beyond measure. We talked about it uh, in uh, when we first met this man, that he would become one of the primary reasons that you or I even have heard the gospel was because of what he is going to do later on. But this is how he got his start. He's a murderer. He's been killing Christians. And God has now got a hold of him, shaking him up here, and going to get his attention in a mighty way. And it's going to penetrate his heart with truth and a revelation that there's never again going to be a doubt as to who he is in his life. And so... Again, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are pers persecuting. But rise and enter into the city, and you will be told what you're going to do. Remember, he fell to his knees in this bright light. He says, get up, get in the city, and you wait. I'll be back. We'll have a conversation. You'll be told what's going to happen. You just get up and, and, and head in. And the men who were traveling with him stood there speechless, hearing the voice, but seeing no one. So they, they didn't see the sight that, that Saul saw. As Saul saw the, Saul saw, Saul witnessed the resurrected Christ before him in all his glory. That's the light you see. But these guys, all they did was hear the voice. It's very similar if we go back to Jesus' baptism where the dove came down from heaven and rested on him and uh, there was light all around him. But what the crowd heard was the voice. This is my beloved son. And, and so uh, uh, we, we see this. So here, uh, verse Eight. Am I still on your screen here, verse 8? Yes, I am. Okay. So Saul rose from the ground, and although his eyes were opened, 
He saw nothing. He was blind. This bright light has blinded him. And so he got up, but he couldn't see. And so the, the, the men uh, grabbed him and led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. So here's this man. It's coming full, full fury forward into Damascus with a purpose to take, arrest, and murder Christians. And now he's so humbled, he's entering the city that he was heading to, blind and having to be helped by others. <laughs> he's been humbled big time, hasn't he? And so... In verse 9, and there for three days he was without sight and neither ate or drank. So he's left in a, a room, we'll find out here in a bit, uh, and he sat there for three days. He did not eat. He did not uh, drink. He basically <laughs> prayed and spent time with himself. Uh, and it's interesting, this three-day thing. There's something special about three, aren't there? Christ rose again in three days. Well, that's going to be about what's going to happen to Saul here. But that three is, is something uh, important in this uh, revelation of who Christ is. And that is uh, interesting that it is occurring here as well. And so they let him in the hand, and, and for three days he was without sight, neither ate or drank. And now there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias. Now the question is, is uh, was he one of them that had been in Jerusalem that witnessed what happened to Stephen and was one of those that was scattered? Or was this one that was there? Well, uh, we don't totally know, but this guy does know all about Saul and who he was and what he's been doing and why he was there in Damascus in the first place. So it's almost going to be a little bit comical what we're about to see, but yet it's going to be serious at the same time. And he's going to obediently obey the Lord. Uh, but Ananias... So the Lord said to him in, in a vision, Ananias, and he said, Here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, Rise and go to the street called Straight. By the way, that street is still there today. Still there. You can go to that street. It's still called Straight, too. And that's interesting. And at uh, the house of Judas, and this is not the same Judas that you know about because he's he hung himself a long time ago here uh, when Christ was at. This isn't the betrayer, but that name Judas is a very popular name in, in the uh, society as a whole. So uh, it's a very common name. So you go to the house of Judas and look for a man of Tarsus. Tarsus is, is a little island uh, a little bit farther north. Actually, we're going to see him uh, go to Tarsus later in the book of Acts, but uh, uh, that's his hometown, if you will, okay? Uh, he's a, a, a man of Tarsus named Saul. For behold, he is praying, and he has seen a vision of a man named Ananias. That's you! <laughs> a man named Ananias to come in and lay hands on him that he might regain his sight. Okay, now think about this. Put yourself in Ananias' shoes at this point. You're, you're having a conversation with God. And God says, um, I want you to go to this house on straight, uh, straight Street. There's a guy there. And he's praying right now. And his name is Saul, and he's from Tarsus. You go, I know this guy. And I want you to go there to him. What? And I want you to lay your hands on him and pray. And I'll tell you what to do. And this guy 
Can you imagine yourself being this guy going, are you nuts, God? Do you not know who this guy is? That's what would be going through my mind. In fact, listen to the next few verses here. Listen to what he says. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And here he and, he, and here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all that call on your name. But the Lord said, go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how much he must suffer for my the sake of my name wow this uh, term chosen instrument in the greek it actually uh means a, a, a vessel of election if you will uh, uh would be the best term it's almost a, a political term that they would have used uh and phrase so uh but uh yeah uh, ananias says what you and i would say what are you talking about go to this guy this don't you know who this guy is uh, this guy's killing us he's doing evil uh, to people that believe in you uh, why would i want to even go anywhere near him you know uh but the lord says go and he says look this guy is a chosen instrument of mine. And he's going to carry my name. And he's going to go forth to the Gentiles and the kings and all the children of Israel. He's And he's going to do that. And you know what? It ain't going to be easy on him. He's going to learn how to suffer for my name's sake. In the same way, this is Jesus talking to him. And the same way that Jesus suffered for the sake of his father's will. Saul is going to learn to do that for the sake of Christ. And uh, and so if we look at the next verse, Ananias is obedient. He says, <clears throat> and so Ananias departed and entered the house and laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, remember, he's afraid of this guy. He didn't want anything to do with this guy. This guy's been killing people like him. And he uses that term of endearment, brother. God has laid in Ananias' uh, heart the fact that Saul is now a follower of the way. He's not the same guy. And so he believes God and uses a term in endearment, even though in his heart he's probably still kind of going, yeah, but I don't, I'm not sure I trust you yet. But God said so, so let's see what we can do. Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road by which you came has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with, with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes and he regained his sight. He and then he rose and was baptized. Notice there's not an argument, there's not a threat. But there's a guy that's been fasting, if you will, for 3 days eating and drinking he's blind he's scared he's humbled he's also joyful by the light he has seen and now uh that the same god who shook him up in a hard way to reality is now opening his eyes to see but to see not just visually, but to see spiritually. And that, my friends, 
is incredible. That's what happens when we too are confronted with Jesus Christ and the light of Christ shines in our hearts and we fall to our knees and our eyes are even so we could look around and see things we were still spiritually blind amazing grace i was once blind but now i see it's exactly what he's talking about here and as we move into verse 9 and finish that off uh, <clears throat> and taking food he was strengthened so now he he's been healed and he eats and he is strengthened and so we then see what's going to happen to Saul next what where are we going here is he going to turn back and <laughs> you fill my eyes they gave us food so i'm back at it now oh no for some days he was with the disciples at damascus now, again, imagine these disciples. They have to be very, very careful and leery. We know this Saul. We know his reputation. We know why he was coming here, and that was to get us. But he's with them. And immediately he proclaimed Jesus in the synagogue saying he is the son of god can you imagine the shock on these disciples when they hear this saul preaching this truth that jesus is the son of god what a complete reversal his life was upside down it's just been turned right side up and that is incredible in and of itself. And all who heard him were amazed and said, Is this not the man who made havoc in Jerusalem of those called upon the on those who called upon his name? And he has not come here for this purpose but to bring them bound before the, the chief priests. They know why he's there. And they're astounded by what they're seeing and hearing. But Saul increased with more, the more in strength and confounded the Jews who lived in Damascus by proving that Jesus was the Christ. We're going to stop at the end of that verse for this lesson, and we'll pick back up uh, next week on this lesson. But here he is. He's been changed. And we see and know that he is now been brought into not only salvation but he has been forgiven of his sin and he is now totally a hundred percent flip-flopped heading in the right direction does that mean he's going to be free of sin the rest of his life absolutely not in fact he'll talk about that many times how he hates to doing the things that he does not want to do and doesn't do the things that he wants to do he struggled. He's going to struggle with that. He's going to struggle with some other things as well. But it is a flip, a changed heart. He was once against and warring against God. And now he's with God and near God. And proclaiming the truth of the gospel as that Holy Spirit resides in him. It's a beautiful thing we see here. Now, some people have said to me before, well, you know what? This is a miraculous salvation. Uh, and Hey, friends, every single one of us that come to know Christ have just as miraculous a salvation as we see Saul have. We don't need a 
bright light in the sky that knocks me to my knees and makes me go blind and I have to be helped up and taken in and wait for three days before somebody comes in to, to help. I, that might be miraculous in the eyes of the world, but the fact of the matter that we are dead in our trespasses and sin, warring against God in our lives, wanting nothing to do with him. We won't even seek God. And God comes into our lives and in our hearts reveals the truth of Jesus Christ. And immediately we began to see who we are without him in our sin. And we began to repent in our heart for those sins. And we began to look and put our faith and trust in Christ to bring us out of that and to give us eternal life as he's promised in his word even though we do not deserve it. He gives us that grace. Friends, that's just as miraculous as what we read in this scripture about what happened to Saul. It's not the events going on around. It's what's happening to our lives. For God to even love us that much to do it is miraculous when we consider who we are and what we have done and what we deserve. That's encouraging to us to see that he has done the same for us. My friend, I pray that he has done that for you. And if he had, uh, and you have questions about this or questions about yourself, please, hit an email. Let me know about it. We'll be glad to talk to you individually about it. You're about to see our contact email go right by on the screen right there. There it goes. It's rbgf22 at yahoo.com. That's rbgf22 at yahoo.com. Shoot that email over and let us know. If right now the Lord has got a hold of you and you know that he's telling you truth, let us know. We'll celebrate that together. We'll answer those questions that you still might have. We'll, and boy, we just look forward to having you. Yes, you've been joining the fellowship as we go through studies together, but then you're really going to join the fellowship as a brother and sister in Christ. That's our prayer for you. If you're a believer here today and you have kind of taken your salvation for granted a little bit, maybe you've walked away from the faith a little bit, and now you're remembering what it is that you've been called to do and you've been brought and where you've been brought out of and that you've been made anew in Christ, I tell you, use that email. Send us your testimony of what is God has done for you that we might celebrate it as well. Do that today. My friends, I hope you uh, go and read the rest of chapter nine by next week. I am going to be on a vacation for a couple of days myself uh, that time of year, right? Yeah, but uh, when we return uh, next week's at the end of the week, it'll, another video will drop. And uh, I'd love to be able to come back and read all those, be able to talk about those things. I won't mention your name, but I'll be glad to talk about uh, what is happening with you guys with you guys, what God is doing in your life. That would be so exciting. So I hope you join us for that. Please make sure that you do go to all our platforms, like, share, and, and follow, and all those things. Subscribe. You need to subscribe to this YouTube channel so that you make sure you get all the videos. 
um, and you share it out. Bring your friends into this. Let's make this thing uh, grow uh, to a point that, uh, man, we can open up chat rooms and we can open up all kinds of stuff if we if we want to do that. And so we are looking for uh, leaders to help join and, and and help us create new content. So if you feel the Lord uh, talking to you about doing some of that, please, please shoot me an email uh, again so that we can uh, know who you are, find out what it is God's talking to you about and what you're feel, being led to do and see how we can utilize that so that God might be glorified. So let's pray and then we'll close out for the evening. Almighty God, we're just so thankful that we could come together. We pray, Lord, that just like you've done with Saul, we're so thankful that each one of us who have accepted Christ has been through that same exact thing. It might not be all Hollywood like we picture this story of Saul, but it's just the same thing that's happening in the heart. And that explosion of your glory in our lives is incredible. We don't deserve it. We deserve to be in hell. But Lord, you, you, you and you alone have rescued us out of that. We can't earn our way out. We couldn't change our lives. We couldn't do anything, but you did, just like you did with Saul. You invaded and changed, and we thank you for that. Lord, I pray for any that are among our fellowship that are hearing this for the first time that have never, ever accepted the revelation that you are placing in their hearts. I pray, Lord, that you would make it so real to them that you would bring them into salvation this very moment. And then they go out to that email and proclaim it so we can just celebrate what you have done, Lord. It's so great. Lord, until we meet again next week, I pray that you would be with each of us. That you would lead us to, to go and to read your word. And when we come back, man, we're going to be fired up for what you have done. Because we have been with you. Lord, we thank you again for the time together. We love you. We praise your holy name. And we lift this prayer in the precious and holy name of Jesus Christ. And God's children all said amen and amen. And friends, I love you. And we will see you again next week. Have a good week.